Good morning. My name is Stephen. I am the youth director here at Calvary, and I'm, I'm glad that you are here worshiping with us today. Uh, this season of the household of the Nichols family is an interesting one because we are very quickly approaching the toddler stage of life with our son, uh, which is a really, really fun and unique moment. And his name is Gabriel. You can throw him up on the screen there. Uh, he's cute. He's a cute kid. And Here's the thing, the thing that I'm most nervous about, about having a potential toddler, he's a year and a half, so I don't know if that's considered a toddler yet or not, but he, he's approaching very quickly. But more than anything, the thing that makes me more fearful about having a toddler is going out in public places. Any parents uh, like relate to that idea at all? And, and here's why. Because I know that most of the time he's going to be happy, he's going to be laughing, smiling, joyful, and I know that he is going to be the most lovable, cute little guy of all time. Uh, but I also know that at the drop of a hat, for reasons only known to himself, he can very quickly going from looking like this <laughs> to looking like that. And uh, if it tells you anything about our parenting, instead of comforting him, we took a picture of him. So <laughs> I thought like that was the right thing to do. Uh, but, but we don't know why. We don't know why sometimes he'll just freak out and maybe it's because we had to take something away or because we couldn't give him something. And this is what toddlers do. And I'm afraid that we will be in the middle of Wegmans or a restaurant and this will happen. And here's why. It's not even necessarily because we have to deal with him, that we have to do something about the attitude that he's having. It's because, parents back me up on this, it's because everyone else, they don't look at the kid, they look at you. And they're, I know, they're judging like, oh, they're a bad parent. They're a bad parent. Like if, and, if, and those who don't have kids yet, they're always like, if, when I have a kid, never, right? <laughs> never is this going to happen. Yeah, I said that too. I said that too. And I'm standing here in the middle of it. I'm like, why are you yelling at me? He's the one freaking out here. Like, yell at him. What are we doing here? Uh, but it's, it's uncomfortable. It is so uncomfortable. Nobody likes making a scene. If you're a parent, this is probably one of the most awkward things to happen. If your kid makes, has a meltdown, because there's nothing you can do. Everyone's looking at you. It is unbelievably uncomfortable. It is terrifying to make a scene in front of that. And parents, if you're with me on that, say amen, because it is, it's tough. <laughs> you don't have to clap, okay? We don't have to clap, but. But the story today, in the next part of Matthew, is uncomfortable. It is very uncomfortable. Because we are giving a picture of Jesus where he walks into a place and he makes a scene. And at first glance, it looks like he is throwing a fit of rage. And it's uncomfortable. And the questions that come up with this is, what on earth is Jesus doing? Why is he doing this? And this is the story. It's a famous story in the Bible of when Jesus enters into the temple of God and he starts to physically flip tables. And we have to ask, what on earth is Jesus doing? And the question, more importantly, that we are going to hopefully tackle more than anything today, and this is a real question, is do we serve a God of uncontrollable anger. Do we serve a God of uncontrollable anger? And this is a legitimate and relevant question because I know that there are maybe people in this room who are watching online or maybe who have never attended here who have rejected faith, have rejected God, rejected the Bible because they believe the God of the Bible is an angry, uncontrollable God and they want nothing to do with it. Do we serve a God of uncontrollable anger? It's a legitimate question. And in order to answer this, I want to do a couple of different things. And I want to prepare you so we're all on the same page as we go out through this. I want to very intentionally and deeply look at the words that Jesus speaks while he is doing this. Because I think it sheds a ton of insight as to why and how he is doing things. It's so important. Then at the end of that, we are going to take what we have learned from that and apply it to ourselves to figure out how can this change my perception of Jesus, what I believe about him, what I believe about myself, and how should I now live or act Act, believe differently knowing this. Does that make sense? Does that work for all of you guys? So I will warn you that as we go throughout this passage, that there may be times where it feels like we are winding down a rabbit trail. I'm going to encourage you, stay with me on this because it will pay off in the end. Does that sound good? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on this. Perfect. Are you ready to dive into this unbelievably fascinating story? Matthew 21 says this. 
Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of all saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you Lord have called forth your praise. And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. So I want to pause here and just reflect for a moment. Could you imagine for a moment what this experience might have felt like if, if we were there? If on a regular Sunday morning service, we're all in here listening to a message, Pastor Bob or whoever is up on stage preaching the message, and some guy who is well known in the community comes into our auditorium while we are sitting worshiping, he comes into our auditorium and physically starts flipping tables and chairs over, and then even more, he starts yelling Old Testament prophets. <laughs> Could you imagine how uncomfortable this moment, if you were there, would be? In fact, it wouldn't just be uncomfortable, it would be terrifying especially today, if someone came in and started doing that here in this room, I imagine that there would be quite a few people who would tackle this dude before he could get any further. This is a terrifying, uncomfortable, awkward thing that Jesus is doing here. And I think, I think that there are normally two different responses when we see the story of Jesus flipping these tables. Response number one is this. What happened to kind and tender Jesus? This is not the Jesus that we have known, right? What happened to the Jesus that, soft, that speaks softly to the woman at the well or heals the blind and the lame and, and speaks uh, calmly to people? Where's that Jesus? And can we have that Jesus back? Because I'm not so sure that I'm comfortable with this Jesus. Can we go back to a Jesus that I can control and keep calm? That's reaction number one. Reaction number two is this. Righteous anger. <laughs> And we feel good about this passage. We say, finally, Jesus is showing his true colors. And he's, after all, a strong God who brings judgment and justice. And he goes in there and flips the tables. And we are excited that he's finally going after those people. And even more than that, we will now use this story as permission for us to also go out and flip tables. And while we are having outbursts of anger, we will call it something called righteous anger. And then we'll say things like, well, Jesus flipped tables, so I'm allowed to as well. These are the two responses that I think that we normally have when we read this story. And I'm sure there's more, but these are the two main ones. So the question has to be asked, what is Jesus doing? Why is he doing it? Is he a God of uncontrollable anger? And how are we to respond to this? And I think to answer those questions, we have to start with where Jesus is. Jesus is in the middle of the temple of God. He's physically located in the temple of God. And the temple was the place, the place where God's spirit literally rested inside the temple, that he dwelled there. It was his house. And more than that, it was a place where the people of Israel could go and they would meet before God, that the God of Israel and his people would come together in worship and relationship and intimacy. This is a place where the people of Israel could know God and worship and sacrifice before him in the middle of the temple. It's this beautiful image of worship. This is where Jesus is sitting. And my assumption growing up, every time I've read this passage, growing up, my assumption always was that Jesus would come in and he sees that people are doing business inside of the temple. And he gets angry about that because that's, that's just not where business is supposed to be done. So he's saying, go move it out somewhere else. Go do your business elsewhere. But this is the house of the Lord and you shouldn't do that here. And, and I do believe that there is truth to that. But I think that there is something even more devious that is happening uh, than what we can just see on the surface that leads Jesus 
Jesus to take such swift action on this. But ultimately, ultimately, I believe, and I'm going to make the case, hopefully, that I don't believe that this is an act of uncontrollable anger where Jesus is just flying off the lid, losing his temper in an act that he will later regret and feel shameful about later. I don't believe that. And, and here's why. The Gospel of Mark has, tells the same exact story, but Mark includes a small detail that's very important. Very important. Mark 11 uh, says this. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus, in Mark's version of the story, Jesus on day one goes into the temple. He assesses everything. He sees the money changes. He sees the doves. He sees the people selling inside the temple. He assesses it. He takes it in. But what does he do? He leaves. And he goes back home and he sleeps on it. Then the next morning, he comes in and he clears out the temple. Why is this significant? I think that what this is communicating is that Jesus is not losing his temper here. He's not flying off the lid off of, uh, off of something he just noticed right away as we normally would do in a situation like this. But this is an intentional and calculated move by Jesus. That this move was planned out to the T. That he took time to sleep on it. To wait it out to go back in and to make some intentional and calculated moves inside the temple. This is very different than how we normally respond to this passage or how we normally act when something frustrates us. So Jesus responds in this way and he goes in and he does something weird. Well, maybe not so weird, uh, but I think it's fascinating. He goes in and he quotes two Old Testament prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah, two Old Testament prophets. And the first thing is that he says is that my house should be called a house of prayer. And this is a, pass, or a, a part of a passage out of the book of Isaiah. He quotes this. So I want to read this passage that Jesus is quoting from because I think this is part of the motivation as to why Jesus is doing the things that he's doing. And I will warn you on this that we will start to discover some, some very uh, twisted and not so great things about what is happening inside of this temple. So here's, here's can we come into agreement on this? As Before I read this passage of Isaiah, Isaiah, this is where things start to get good. And lock in with me here. Are you ready? Oh, wow. Wow. Some of you are locking with me here because this is where things get good, but and I don't want to lose you on this. Isaiah 56 says this. This is what Jesus is quoting from. And the foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbaths without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, which is shorthand for the, the temple. And give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. God is depicting and describing this beautiful idea that even if you did not belong to the people of Israel, that you had a place in the temple of God, that if you were a foreigner, which was revolutionary, if you were a foreigner, that the temple of God could be called a house of prayer to you, that you were welcome to worship and to come before God. It is a beautiful depiction of the character of God and who God is, that he welcomes and invites the foreigner into his presence. And when Jesus quotes this passage, he is seeming to believe that this is not happening, that the foreigner is not being loved and welcome inside of the temple. So he goes in and he does two things. He flips two tables specifically. Did you catch this? It says that he flipped the pigeon tables and the money changers. I don't like pigeons. They kind of smell and they're a little bit annoying and they poop everywhere. But I'm not going to go flip their cages over just because I don't like them. Why is Jesus picking on the pigeons? And we know from the, the law of God in Leviticus that pigeons, get this, pigeons were to be used as a replacement sacrifice for lambs, goats, and even calves for those who could not afford the other sacrifices. And God presented pigeons that were a cheaper option. And he says that these pigeons are just as beautiful, just as acceptable form of worship before me. So even if, get this, even if you were economically disadvantaged, you too could go and worship in the house of the Lord, that it did not matter. God is providing this generous, 
unbelievably generous statement where he, those who are, dis, are disadvantaged economically, who were poor, could still worship before the Lord. It did not matter where you ranked in that level of economic scale, that you could worship before the Lord. So when Jesus goes in, he flips those tables and he also flips the money changers. Now, the money changers were used to take your currency to purchase temple coin. The only way that you could purchase those pigeons, those lambs, those doves, whatever it is, was with the temple coin. And those who were coming from out of town would bring their currency and replace it with the temple coin. And we know from history that these temple coins, that this exchange process would have high interest. And it would directly line the, pro the pockets of the high priest named Caiaphas. And he was getting rich off this. So here we are, and we're given this image of the temple that is supposed to be a house of prayer for all nations, for all people, whether you are rich or poor or uh, insider, outsider. And we are given a picture of a system and a structure where the priests are specifically taking advantage and targeting those who are foreigners, who are outsiders, and those who are poor. And Jesus was not having it. And in typical Jesus fashion, he rocks the boat even further. And he quotes his second Old Testament prophet, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 7, specifically. And this is the part in his, Israel's history where they had completely lost their way. That they were, in Jeremiah 7, it says that they were taking advantage of the widows, of orphans. They were shedding innocent blood. They were ignoring children. And Jeremiah was sent by God to say that you, we will not continue to let this slide, that you cannot continue to take advantage of those people. And Israel at that time had this pride and this arrogance about them that because they had the temple of the Lord in their midst, they believed that nothing could touch them. And God said, oh boy, you guys are in for something here. There, you are not going to be allowed to do this. So get this, Jesus comes into the temple and he quotes this passage and the priests are not dumb people. They know what Jesus is saying. And he is telling them that you are those same people. History is repeating itself. God did not allow it to let it slide then and he's not gonna let it slide now. And they're mad. It says that they were indignant. And Jesus flips those tables over. So the question, going back to this, just so we're clear, why did Jesus flip the tables? Jesus, get this, Jesus breaks down barriers for all who seek to approach his presence. Jesus breaks down barriers for all who seek to approach his presence. That this was to be seen as an act of cleansing. This was not meant to be seen as an act of Jesus losing his temper off the whim. That Jesus was, was bringing in a source of judgment. And judgment, we often, for whatever reason, we have this idea that judgment and anger and uncontrollable anger have to be paired together. But this is not the story of God. We often read anger into this story. It's never mentioned in this story. We read anger into the story because of our own past experiences and our own unhealthy expressions of anger. Was Jesus angry? Maybe. He might have been. But our anger and Jesus's anger are two very completely different things. And we see this story through our unhealthy lens of anger when Jesus is responding out of this judgment, not just for the sake of punishment, but to create a pathway where those who are being taken advantage of could be included in the presence of God. This is why Jesus is flipping these tables. In nothing makes this more clear, I think, than verse 14. Going back to Matthew 21, verse 14 says this. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. I have this picture often that, that when this happens, I often have this picture that, that everyone is just scattering. And to be fair, there were people who were running, that everyone's just trying to get away from Jesus as quick as possible because they're terrified of him. But it's not true. Some people ran, but there was a large group of people who actually ran towards Jesus. And it were those who were poor, who were broken, who were sick, who were oppressed, 
the foreigners, the outsiders, that they actually went towards Jesus. And Jesus healed him. He used this as an opportunity to provide a pathway to invite them to himself. They didn't see this as a rampage that Jesus was going on. They saw this as an act of mercy and compassion that they too could enter into the presence of God and worship the God of Israel. We only see the tables in this story. We only see Jesus flipping tables, and rightly so, because it's pretty dramatic. But the reason for that, the reason why this took place was so that Jesus could go close to the people who were hurting and being taken advantage of. It was the reason in all of this. So to end this question, if we are people, as I often have been, that read this story and get very excited because we're ready to go off and flip some tables. We're ready to go off on some people. And I've been there, I've done that. I think this story encourages us to ask a different question. Instead of looking out and saying, what tables can I flip on somebody else's life? I think the, the encouragement of this story is to look inwardly and to ask the questions, what tables do I need flipped inside of my own heart? What tables do I need flipped inside of my own heart? Because here's the thing. We never believe that it is our tables that need to be flipped. We always believe that it's somebody else who needs their tables flipped. But I think the encouragement and the message of this story is that we so easily can slip into a mode where we are ignoring, whether consciously or unconsciously, people who are different outsiders than us. And Jesus needs to be allowed to flip the contents of our heart and pull out what is there so that not only us, but those around us can have direct access to the God of Israel. So here's my question. Are we going to allow us to take a deep look and reflection into our hearts, into our character, into our lives, to allow Jesus to pull out the things that should not be there? And I will ask a few questions. Who are the people in our life that we would consider outsiders? And how do we think about them? Who are the friends or the family members who we know have felt excluded from the church of God? How do we respond to them? Who are the people that we can't stand because they're different than us? How do we respond to them? And all of a sudden, these money changers of our hearts start to come to life. And I, I believe that Jesus wants more than anything to flip those, not only just so they can experience God's presence, so that we can as well. We never believe that it is our tables that need to be flipped. So are we willing to walk a journey of deep reflection and confession and even repentance for the things that we have put in front of other people and be willing as Jesus has to go after people who are outsiders, to go after people who are broken, who are down on their luck so that they too can know the goodness of God. This is the story and the purpose of Jesus. Are you not glad that Jesus is the kind of God that would go towards those who don't deserve it? Why? Because that's me. Are you not glad that we serve a Jesus who brings freedom to those who need his presence more than anything? Because that's me. Are we willing to allow ourselves to look deeply and reflect the inside of our hearts and allow him to flip the tables of our hearts? I'm gonna ask the worship team to come back up here as we close. Um, so it's very possible uh, that you identify with somebody completely different inside of the story. That it's possible that you're not identifying most with the priest or with Jesus even or the disciples. It is possible that the people that you most identify in the story are the outsiders. That you have felt excluded from the family of God. That you have felt like everything in your life has passed you by. 
that it feels like you can never get ahead in life, that you've had sickness or disease or loss of loved ones, so you are stuck in this moment while everyone else is cruising past you. Or maybe there have been people inside the church who have said terrible things to you, and you feel like you do not have a place in the presence of God. If that is you, as I know that there are people in this room who may feel that way, who are watching, who may feel that way, I want to encourage you with something. Can I encourage you with something? A week from this event where Jesus does this, one week later, exactly, Jesus goes on a cross to die and to be raised from the dead. And we believe that Jesus was the ultimate and perfect temple of God, God's dwelling among us. And he goes where it's this beautiful picture of God's truth, God's justice, and his grace meeting together fully on the cross. And he goes, and the purpose, the reason for this is so that all barriers can be removed between you and the presence of God. That God on that cross, by surrendering his son flipped every table that stands between you and the presence of God so that, so that you can have relationship with the God of the universe, with your creator. It is the message in the story of the gospel. So if you are walking into this room and you feel like the outsider, that you feel like the broken, you feel like the sick, you feel like the poor, you feel like the ones that everyone is excluding, the encouragement of the cross is to tell us that Jesus has removed every obstacle and he's standing before you, the path is clear, the money changers are gone, he's standing before you, he's inviting you to himself. And the question that now remains for you is how will you respond to the invitation of Jesus to come near? so that you may be healed. Will you come before Jesus and step into the presence of God and he welcomes you? Let's pray. Father, we come before you ready to worship, grateful for the things that you have done in our lives. Lord, we confess that there are tables that I've built inside of my own heart, that there are structures or systems even, even that we have allowed to let go that prevent people from seeing you clearly. Lord, we pray that we remove any unnecessary obstacle that stands in the way between people and finding your grace. And I pray for those who will, who will declare that they feel broken, that they feel like the outsider, the foreigner, the poor, the oppressed, that they are in this room. And Lord, I pray that you, they feel known and welcome in the presence in the house of God, that they know that there can be healing, there can be life, there can be renewal, there can be a new pathway forward, that sin can be forgiven, shame taken away, guilt cleared because of your son. And I pray that they respond to that invitation in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's respond in worship, friends. I'll ask you to stand on your feet.